Everything in this world is bound by rules. There are rules for physics, then there are norms and regulations within the lighting, architecture, and construction industry. So when Dubai announced that they were going to build the world's largest Ferris wheel, they had set themselves quite a challenge, basically challenging and testing the boundaries of physics. Only a few weeks after opening the Ferris wheel, they had to close again, with no reopening date in sight. Today, it is the world's largest Ferris wheel, however one that doesn't turn. It is a rule that is challenged, that was challenged, however, could not be broken, at least not yet. And throughout history, we've seen many ambitious architectural projects just like that, pushing the boundaries of the industry. Some were realized, like the Ferris wheel, and some weren't, maybe because of regulatory challenges or because they were just not in line with the convention of the time. And then you have the work of architect and environmentalist Hundert Wasser. He envisioned unconventional and dreamlike buildings featuring vegetation and trees growing from their exterior. His work inspires many, and also Stefano Buri, who planned the high rises called Toro Bosco Verticale in Milan. I love Toro Bosco Verticale because it's a high rise full of trees. The trees on the facade help to filter the natural daylight, with this reducing energy consumption for both heating and cooling. And I love this example because it shows how nature can be integrated into densely populated urban environments. It's an unconventional building, one that is beautiful and one that breaks with convention. It is one that breaks and thus makes the rules. And where, generally, new-built constructions are seen as easier and cheaper in terms of planning and cost, it are the architects La Satan and Vassal who show us otherwise. They demonstrate how mass housing, built in the 1960s, can be reinvented. Rather than resorting to demolition and new construction, which would lead to significant waste and environmental harm, they advocate for renovation through thoughtful intervention by adding balconies and winter gardens to these flats. They make them more generous, pleasant, and environmentally sustainable. It's a beautiful example of how energy sufficiency in construction and buildings doesn't need to mean just focusing on energy metrics and insulation. By opening these flats to light, air, and views, they make them way more generous, pleasant, and environmentally sustainable. So by focusing on the living quality and the well-being of these inhabitants, they improve this space. And in terms of cost-effectiveness, this project was three times cheaper than what any demolition and new construction would have been. It's a beautiful example of how well-being for the inhabitants, together with sustainability and cost-effectiveness, can be merged. It is a project that breaks and thus makes the rules. So what would be possible, knowing that 35% of all waste in EU's landfills comes from construction sites? We need to urgently think and rethink the way we build, design, and produce. And while we're already seeing sustainable action being undertaken in terms of production and new materials being developed, it is using and reusing what is already there that is the most sustainable option. So what if we start seeing the city as a resource? By using and reusing what is already there, we can pave the way for a new vernacular, a new local style, one that combines local architecture with climate and cuts down distribution roads. And there, while we're already seeing practices that combine the old with the new, 
this is very often led to personal conviction, either from the client or the designer. So when I was asked to coordinate the demolition of one of my own projects, a site-specific yet modular lighting installation, I took it upon myself to find new houses or new homes for these lighting fixtures. From illuminating this co-working space, they went to illuminating other homes, offices, and a restaurant in Hamburg. Here, our client had to leave unforeseen because of issues within the space, and these fixtures still had a lot of lifetime ahead of them. Together with urban mining company Conkler, we found fixtures that we repurposed and refurbished them to state-of-the-art tunable white lighting fixtures that formerly belonged to Robert Koch Institute, which is the federal agency of disease control in Germany. And this is an example of how circularity in architecture can create buildings with a story and with a past, as buildings become compilations of elements with a history. And so what is holding circularity in architecture and construction back? On the one hand, it are the regulations and the norms. On the other hand, it is the cost. While the material cost might be less, as I mentioned before in the social housing project, it is the planning and the coordination that is more time intense and therefore also more expensive. For investors, that means that the unpredictability with the materials available, together with the cost for planning and the upfront investment, yeah, makes them a little bit afraid. But also there, we're seeing examples of brave investors and clients who show us that this can be done, like Impact Hub Berlin, where 70% of all material was recycled, upcycled, or designed with their next life in mind. Together with the architects, we planned for this assembly from the start, accepting that we're living in a fast-changing world. So applying circularity in construction and real estate needs clients, contractors, investors, and designers that are brave and that want to do better, that want to envision a circular building industry and a circular future. I believe that all rules can be broken if the project is better than the rules. Thank you.